They both have been on the front lines of the Walter Scott case from day one. And in this special edition of Quentin's Close-Ups, I speak exclusively with Pastor Thomas Dixon and Elder James Johnson. Well, gentlemen, let's begin with the obvious. Alrighty. Yesterday, Monday, was the one-month anniversary of Walter Scott's death. Mm -hmm. Tell me as we sit here right now, where are your emotions? Hmm. Well, my emotions, is, is, is still looking at the video, is very sad. It just uh, rehash the day that Walter Scott got shot. And my emotions actually was focusing on the family and the mother and, 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 and what they were thinking when they saw that video. So, yeah, for, um, for me, it's, um, it's been a, first off, it's been a long 30 days. It's been a very long 30 days. There's a lot that's transpired, but it seems like we, we really haven't gotten anywhere. You know, it seems like we're stuck on three days after his murder with the release of the video. There's been no progress as far as the community development and interaction with City Hall. There's been no progress as far as our getting a voice into law enforcement. There's uh, been overall, uh, it seems to be a, a staunch rejection of um, the participation and interaction that is going to take for us to work through this situation and to become a better community in the aftermath of it. So where are my emotions at? It? I'm just as frustrated as I was from day one. And before Monday's anniversary, I understand that you actually held, initially held a rally at the Charleston County, uh, Charleston County Courthouse, and that quickly turned into a press conference, what I heard. The, on the one year, the one year anniversary? Yesterday, yeah. Well, the, yeah, basically that's what, uh, that's what it was originally meant for. Okay. Was to get the, um, the word out that we are now working as a collective, right. whereas uh, during the first uh, weeks of this ordeal, we... And we more or less uh, were acting independently from one another, um, but we decided that uh, the best way for us to move forward would be for all of us to raise one collective voice um, in uh, representing uh, Walter Scott and in honor of his, his memory. One voice on the one month anniversary. And just before we taped this particular interview, you guys were angry because you just got some devastating news. Of course, of course. Mm -hmm. The, the news that um, the state attorney general decided to keep Mrs. Uh, Scott Wilson, the prosecutor here in trial from Dodgers and Berkeley County, on the case we feel from her past record that she don't represent the community when it comes to a police officer killing, uh, beating a, a minority, a black male or female. So we thought that she should not be on the case looking at her records in the past. She has not convicted uh, any, any police officer for killing or beating a black person. And we will diligently pursue this to see what we can do to actually get her off the case. And knowing that Alan Wilson really won't get himself involved with this case, what does that tell you? That tells, that tells me that um, he's a part of the problem also. Um, that we, we, we are we commonly known to be up under a system that's been labeled the good old boy system, where there are entities in government and law enforcement that more or less cover their own backs. Okay. Um, at the expense of the, uh, uh, the community out here that has elected them, selected them, and actually pays their right. salary. Right. And that's why it really shouldn't have been any problem when we uh, respectfully asked that uh, Scarlett Wilson recuse herself from this case because the community, the people who pay her salary, the employer, asked her nicely to walk away from this case. And her as the employee, we fully expected her to honor our wish. Well, we are finding out that she has no respect for the fact that the taxpayer uh, pays her salary, neither does her um, statewide supervisor, which would be the attorney general, right? they have no respect for those who pay their salaries. So we have to, unfortunately, in many situations where respect should be something that is just a given by nature, this is one time we're going to have to ensure that respect is given where respect is due. The employee, Scarlett Wilson, the attorney general, they are going to understand, and our governor will have to understand that they work for the people and the people
people are not going to accept any disrespectful treatment of the people anymore. And so now that Alan Wilson won't get involved and Scarlett Wilson won't recuse herself, what would you like Governor Hilly to do next? <laughs> That's a loaded question <laughs> because I don't expect she'll do anything to help what we're doing. She's not of the people, by the people, and for the people, even though that's the way she was elected, supposedly, and selected. She's for her people. And when I say her people, I mean her party and all of those that are affiliated with her party, the Tea Party, the Conservative Party, the Republican Party, but not the party that's of the rest of the people. <laughs> well, it's very important that South Carolina realize this conservative party never put poor, poor people, uh, black folks, uh, because some of the, the, the laws that's been, been made against poor people, uh, the Confederate flag tells you a whole lot. Mm -hmm. When they, they don't respect the wishes of the black community because the, the flag is, itself is, is actually, uh, as far as black concerned, it's a memory of slavery. One thing is being mentioned in South Carolina from the Democratic Party. In the last election, last two elections, uh, president election, uh, our president Barack Obama, we know that this state can be turned blue. It was almost a national election, almost turned blue. On from Columbia on back down to Charleston, where more people voted on the Democratic side than ever before. So they're looking at this state turning blue. So it's very important that every single soul in South Carolina get registered to vote. Because we actually can actually have South Carolina, and it would be hysterical if this state turned blue. Because they haven't been blue for, for many, many, many years. That's what civil rights organizations are working on right now. And then when we can do that, put people in office who have the interest of poor people, and a lot of those laws can be changed. And that's what we need to work on, turning this state blue. And everybody in this state old enough to vote needs to be rich to vote. It's a win-win situation for the state and for the underserved people that lives in the state of South Carolina. One thing we have to realize, when it comes to police brutality, uh, uh, we have 905 blacks that have got killed in the hands of the police within the last five years. You know, Alan Wilson and Scott Wilson are all responsible for it also. How so? Uh, because they have only been three convicted and none never spent time. So we look at the history of Alan Wilson, Scott Wilson, we need a change in the law. In order to in order to make things change in this community, we must have people to raise their vote and vote to make this change. And how will uh, I know you mentioned this briefly, but how will the National Action Act will take care of that? Well, we're standing. Well, we're starting a, 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 a very ridiculous voter registration drive throughout the state of South Carolina and other organizations who do that simply because the National Democratic Party know that this state can turn blue. So they're going to put the money out there to help this state turn blue. Yeah. And you know, you guys, going back to the Walter Scott case, um, I want to take it back to the beginning because it was last Friday when I was actually off from work at Mark Trudelli and I actually ran into you guys downtown. Mm -hmm. And you had a, a really somber and peaceful rally. Tell me, what do you remember about that particular rally? About um, the which one? Friday, uh, Friday morning. No, it was Friday, Friday morning. Uh, yeah. That was basically dealing with the Scarlett Wilson situation. Right. Um, and us calling uh, for her to recuse herself from this case. Um, our our focus is always nonviolent. Our, fo our focus is peaceful revolution. Okay. Um, we do believe that um, ultimately it's the power of the people that's going to turn this whole situation around. It's not the power of the people burning and looting and uh, as we say, acting a fool, uh, uh, we don't believe we don't believe that adding fire to fire is going to put a fire out. That's not, that's not how it works. So we how would you put this fire out? The pe the people, 
that's what we're in now. We're in a uh, we're in a people network build process. Okay. We're in we're awakening the sleeping giant, and unfortunately, it's based here in South Carolina on the blood of Walter Scott, but it extends beyond South Carolina to Baltimore with Freddie Gray and Mike Brown and Ferguson and all the blood of all of those that has been shed um, over time uh, at the hands of law enforcement officers that is seemingly galvanizing a community, to bringing our people together, giving our people a more uh, a, an awakening of consciousness as far as the people power, the unity that we're supposed to have, reestablishing the village principle where we understand more uh, that we are responsible for our village and we have to do things such as police our village, ensure that our educational process is adequate for our children, making sure that law enforcement does not overstand its, say, its bounds and our government officials and that they do answer to the people, that making sure that we are a, a voting block and not a talking block uh, those are the things that we're pushing right now, and basically we're trying to wake, awaken the sleeping giant. If the giant would awaken as it did 50 years ago, there's nothing that we can't move in this nation that we would want to move. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Elder? Well, you have to be aware of what's happening every single day in Charleston. There is young people in the civil rights movement that is popping up all around us. Sure. Mm -hmm. we, have, we probably have about... And not only black organizations, but white organizations join joining the fight. We probably mm -hmm. have at least at least twenty of them right now, mm -hmm. from the College of Charleston right. on down to to Black Lives Matter, okay. are joining the fight. We we need that young people input. They realize now that the system here in America is not fair. Mm -hmm. They realize that blacks are getting killed in a large number by by the hands of the police department and been getting with, with it for years. They realize now that their life matters, and mm -hmm. if they do not take their lives in their own hand, uh, it will set the civil rights movement back a hundred years. So, so we welcome everybody. I'm tired. I'm pretty sure Pastor Dixon is tired. At least sixty plus. Wow. You know, and and we need to to pass this knowledge and this information that we have in our heads on to these young people so, because. As long as America is here, and as long as the world is here, there will be racism and discrimination because of the color of one man's skin. So, so the fight, it's, it's, it's just begun. It's just begun, and it will never, ever end. And how will you assure that? Uh, uh, that, that? That the knowledge is passed on? That too? Uh, simply because of what we, what we did on yesterday, and, and what we did, we sent a strong message to the mayor and the police department that there is no division among these organizations. And we sit at the table and pass that knowledge on. And we learn from them and they learn from us. So so if we continue doing that, 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 that movement will, will, will catch on fire. And people realize right now that it's not fair. We look at economical boom in Charleston, South Carolina. Billions of dollars are being made in, 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 in Charleston, South Carolina, but there's no blacks at the table. That has to change because if we continue uh, uh, producing un undeserved community where black folks and poor folks are not a part of the economical boom and sitting at the table, we're going to breed crime. When we breed that crime, uh, we're going to still have a police occupying force in the community. So if we can get rid of the poverty, and America can because it's wealthier, can get rid of the poverty, and then the police won't have an occupying force in the community. Why well, I say that? They are not an occupying force in the white community. There's not that much crime there. But what we see here, in, in, in mostly black community, is something that they create, under, a, a underclass of people that they create. Who created it? The system has created it. We, we, and when I'm saying that, uh, the, the, our justice system has put more black men in jail in, this, in, in, in prison system in South Carolina, and there's only 28% of us across the state. I got a problem with that. That means that prison is, is a business and they can put poor people because they cannot afford attorneys uh, and the public defender uh, 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 wants to plead. We got to, across America, 
90% of the court cases are pleaded out. That's something wrong with that. Instead of going to court, you have a public service, I mean a public defender or attorney wants you to plead your case out, saying you, you, you'll get less of time. But what they do, they put the fear in, in the young person's mind that if you go to trial, you can get 20 more years than you do if you plead out. And that's, and, 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 and that's where Scarlett Wilson and Alan Wilson play politics on the back support. They send them to jail. Like get longer sentence and, and, and white do, you know. So that whole system has to change. Speaking of change, let's talk about right now. We're sitting here at the corner of Baker and Dover Streets in North Charleston. Um, I asked Clifford Smith this. He's running for mayor of North Charleston recently, and he I asked him if he wants Eddie Drake to step down, and he almost said yes, but he likes him personally. As we sit here right now, do you think Eddie Drake should step down as chief of North Charleston Police? I'll say this to you. I've been fighting this case myself and Pastor Dixon for just about every police chief that went through North Charleston for the last 21 years. Uh, the culture in the police department have not changed. Eddie Driggers is a likable person. He is. And, a, and he's, he's a religious person. He is. That's true. But that's fine. But he hasn't changed the culture. And when I'm saying changing the culture of the, uh, 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 of the police department, Eddie Driggin may come on the porch and talk to me. I'll talk to the people on the porch. And the people on the porch may like Mr. Driggers. But he, he has not talked to the people in the street that's being racial profiling, that being beaten, or calling the N-word. Those people he has not communicated with. Why is those, are, those are the people who you need to communicate with. Because if he don't, the, the culture is not changed. Uh, if the culture would change, uh, when an officer uh, uh, commit a misconduct on, 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 on a citizen, you know, and he's not reprimanded for that, uh, he went into, in, in, into eternal affairs with, with a complaint, and the public not knowing what happened to that officer, the officer... It's felt like he can continue doing that. So that culture didn't change until that officer is being uh, dismissed from his position, a uh, 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 rank taken away, and he know that when he do things like this, he would be reprimanded, a fire for it. So we got most of the officer, officer who has killed a, a black male have been promoted, you know. So 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 so. Chief Drake has didn't change that culture. This would lead into Walter Scott. And a personal note, he's a nice person, but we need somebody who's going to go in there and change that culture from the bottom to the top. So you're saying he's basically afraid? I say on camera that he's driven by the mayor. The mayor controls the police department. We need the mayor to get out of the police department and let them do their job. That's the problem. The problem is, is, is first off, this strong mayor concept, this kind of this concept, is, there's, a, there's a dictatorship within City Hall. Uh, uh, that, that flows down from the mayor. It was witnessed at the press conference that was called by the mayor's office two days after the video was released, where the community had questions they wanted to ask the chief of police about a police matter. Right. And the mayor stifled any conversation and he answered all the questions. It upset the crowd because he would not let the chief of police uh, answer the questions. Now that's a clear indication of where Chief Driggers is in his position. He is not even allowed to exercise what he possibly would want to exercise as far as dealing with these situations because he's under under the control of this little dictator named Mayor Summy. Um, when it comes to his tenure in office, whether we need to get rid of Driggers or whatnot, I'm, I got mixed emotions on that. He inherited a problem. For one thing, he's only been in that office less. He's less than yeah, less than less than two years, and um, within that time, of course, just as Elder was saying, he has not addressed the culture. But I don't think he's addressed it because he has not been even allowed to. Even though personally he might have blocked that, but everybody nationally has blocked that. Police departments around the nation have blocked what we've said about racial profiling, police brutality. Um, the lack of contribution to a death 
on the victim's part, where the victim is always made as the aggressor. Um, but we've been stonewalled as far as getting that into the ears of the people in law enforcement. And Eddie Driggers is no different. But I think now in the light of what's happened in this case, in the light of the transparency that resulted from the video, forced transparency, it was not anything that they expected to be transparent about. We believe that the cover-up was underway. But the video forced that transparency. In the um, Freddie Gray situation in Baltimore, I believe actually that there's enough there that is forcing that transparency there. But in, and it was, the transparency was also there in Eric Garner's case because of the video. And still they didn't convict. They, 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 they uh, um, uh, acquitted him. Uh, but when we look at, at, at the change in this culture, I believe now we have an opportunity to get inside the heads of those as we ask the question of, of, all, city, of all city halls and law enforcement, do you believe us now? Do we've, at, we've been bringing this to you and you said it's nothing that we can believe. You're making it up. You're too sensitive about this. But now that we have this proof, and we ask the question, do you believe us now? I believe the doors are going to open for us to get to the table, get this dialogue open that can lead to a healing. And I don't know if necessarily if moving Driggers from that spot right now is a good idea because of his the, the, the seeming moral value that he brings to the table and his history, that he might be the right one that would be amenative, um, um, uh, amenative to that, that type of a dialogue where, you know, right is right, and I'm going to stay with what's right. As long as now it's open, it's wide open, let's see how we work together to fix this. Let me add a little bit to that. Mm -hmm. And what I'm telling you, when I talked about the counselor, uh, Chief, Chief Chad Conwell, or, right. or, or uh, police chief in North Charleston, right. then there were the Chief Zuma. Chief Zuma, yeah. yeah. And there were Driggers. Each one of those chiefs I asked, when they go on publicly on TV and tell the community that they will not tolerate police brutality or police misconduct or racial profiling in, in the community. Each one of them refused to do it. Go on TV to refuse to do that. Probably not by their own will, but by the mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to remember the mayor uh, uh, agreed a, a year and a half ago that the type of aggressive policing that he did not want to stop. That means that we would stop a person uh, and, and, and if it's a lie about the taillights or whatever, it, but just stop that person because what they wanted to do is throw a, a broad net mm -hmm. they would catch the criminal in that net. And all they did was alienate law-abiding citizens. Mm -hmm. So with them not wanting to go on TV to talk to the community, that tells me the culture did not change and they didn't want the culture to change. But now, from the video, the culture have to change. Now, from the people that's involved, uh, the culture have to change. And, and, and I know in the last 10 to 7 years, there were nobody involved in North Charleston police brutality and racial profiling, but mainly three persons. That's Pastor Dixon, myself, and Dot Scott. Everybody else was solid uh, on the issue. But right now, we have other organizations that are getting involved singing the same song that we are singing. Let's move from North Charleston to downtown Charleston. As you know, on Saturday, Charleston Police Department actually arrested the 30-year-old Brian Smith in connection with the murder of uh, Georgie Bennett. Uh, there was a drive-by shooting, I believe, on April 18th, right before noon on Reed Street. Uh, Georgie was killed, and another guy was injured when he was holding a three-month-old baby, I believe. Mm -hmm. Tell me, when you heard the news, what was going to your mind? Uh... <laughs> Not anything out of the ordinary. Um, that's some, something within our community that does not surprise me um, in the slightest because when we look at the outcry that we see within our community over these officer-involved shootings, we have probably about 50 times as many shootings such as the Georgie Bennett murder that happens within our community every day of the year. We average on, on, on uh, um, annually in the United States probably a little better than 200 to 300 officer-involved shootings. That number when it comes to black-on-black -black shootings averages around 8,000. So 
when I heard about the drive-by or whatever that transpired with Georgie Bennett down on Reed Street, and dealing with the work that we've been doing in the community for years, because we didn't just start doing this, and we don't just focus on violence when it comes to law enforcement. We deal with black on black, white on black, black on white, bullying, domestic violence, and all of it. So when when I heard about that, it's really like, you know, as far as shock, there's no shock. It's the same disgust, the same frustrations that happened when I heard about Walter Scott. It's something that should not happen, and it's something that we're going to keep on fighting until we see a change in it. I don't, undo, I don't understand why we, as a people, have so little value for one another that we can comfortably kill one another and, and, and then not even stand up to make a concerted cry against that killing, mm -hmm. like we do when uh, a Michael Slager draws his firearm and kills a black man. Why aren't we as angry about that when a brother kills another brother, or when a, 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 a domestic violence situation occurs? Why aren't we as angry about that as when this officer kills a black man? I don't understand it, and that's just pure frustration for me. Let me go back to Walter Scott very quickly. Um, you guys both met with the families. I was surprised at how peaceful and, for, and really how forgiving they were. As we sit here right now, really after the one month anniversary of his death, tell me how is the family doing right now? I spoke with the family on last week and, and taking a certificate from FCLC and, and, and their condolences. And what one of the brothers told me is that it's still hard, but they manage it. It's a day by day situation because right. you had a very close knit family, right. very close knit family there, and um, they lost a loved one that that participated in family activity just about every week, and uh, and, and 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 someone's supposed to, uh, uh, even strangers describe describe him in, as a very nice person who who, have, who have came in contact with him. That's what a I heard. Very very nice mm -hmm. person and a person that would help anybody. Right. So when you get somebody who's upstanding like that in a family, in the family member, in the community, it hurts. It really hurts. So I'm, I, I, I can imagine they're still, uh, they're still grieving for that. Yeah, no, I, my, my interaction with them has been limited, um, but I, I do know and I respect their, the, 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 the quiet power that they present. And I believe that that was one of the reasons why we were able to keep the violence that would, the potential for, for, for violence at a minimum here, because we continue to stress to others the request of the family that that everybody remain calm. But in that same quiet strength, you know, there's some people that take kindness for weakness. And um, I'm going to go back to our Scarlett Wilson here for a minute when I say that. Um, since we a week ago, we asked that she recuse herself from this case. She immediately responded the first time and then responded again, I believe it was yesterday, or the day before yesterday, that she's not going to step away because she's working together with the Scott family. Is and that true? That's the question that we are definitely going to find out because I perceive that as name dropping. Because knowing that you have a, a very quiet, humble family who is not prone to make waves, and probably say, well, she's just saying that. We need to find out if that's the reality or is this something that she's just talking, just tossing out there, first off, to turn the white community against what we're doing, and secondly, to deceive the black community into thinking that her actions are being condoned by this family. Yes, we will get to the bottom of it. Uh, you two are men of God, and you described to me as this past couple of days and even weeks is crazy. As we sit here right now, what would be a, a, a title for a sermon if you were to preach it right now? We should overcome. We we yeah, shall I overcome. And I, and I think since that so since that song was created, we're still trying to overcome. But uh, I know that I believe in God. And I, I know the change have, has to come through Him. And, what you see here is a race of people who has been suppressed since we came here. 
but a race of people who have survived. There is no nationality of people who have endured what black folks have endured and survived. When we talk about the six million people, Jewish people that died in the Holocaust, and it was it's sad, really sad. But no one but the numbers of the 16 million that mm. died from Africa to America from mm. slavery. Nobody, no, nobody talks about that number. Nobody talks about America is the only country who have burned people to the stake and African American people to the stake, or uh, 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 cut their heads off, or uh, hang them for a tree, from a tree. So I say we are, are, are a people that will survive. And we need to be proud that God has chosen black people to populate this earth. When Caucasian realize that they come from the black room, when they realize their history that 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 they came from a black person, then they would understand more more more, more plainly about civilization. You know, we go through this stuff because. God allowed. I don't question God why He allowed it, but it, 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 it makes me stronger to know that the color of my skin that I will be fighting for the rest of my life. So you're thinking this is divine order? It's divine order. You know. I, I, I agree. Now, if we're talking uh, uh, sermon wise, sure. Yeah. Um, I can think of a couple of instances that I would you know, gladly preach on in this. One being the fact that. Um, when the, the children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt, right, in slavery in Egypt for 400, just over 400 years. Relating that to the bondage that we've been in, it was forced slavery on them, even though they started out in goodwill, it still wound up in forced slavery, to the 400 years of enslavement that we've endured here in America. See, when Nobody can tell us why it is in the spiritual realm that the black man is in, has been put through what he has in America. Why were we taken from our native land the way that we were? Why were our people subjected to the horrors of, of, of the slave system uh, here? What's the purpose of it? What's behind it? Well, biblically, we always know that there's God has a plan and a purpose behind whatever goes on. Sure, sure. So I'm, I, and there are things that are always duplicated biblically. So I'm, my prayer is that the period of enslavement of the children of Israel in the Old Testament is what would be called a type and a shadow of what's happening up the, with the with the, the black man in America, of 400, maybe just a little over 400 plus years of slavery. But in the end, God is preparing them to bring them out of this place in a mighty, with a mighty hand. Not taking them to another promised land, but establishing that promised land right here in America. Where our people can have a fair shot at life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What was guaranteed in the writings of, of, of the forefathers here. For all who are here, all men are created equal and endowed by the creators. We didn't write that. They did, and because of that, I believe they put a curse on their own land that God is going to fulfill prophetically sometime soon because we're right in the right time frame. And I believe it's the blood of these young brothers at the hands of police that is going to bring us out. But right now, there's so much apathy within our community about the blood that's being shed at the, by the hands of each other that we're not really able to see God making this move. But I believe that that's going to turn around soon, and as we make our way through 2015 and on into 2016, I see a move of God coming because the second half of this sermon would definitely be based on Jeremiah chapter 51 verses 20 through 23, where God calls his people his battle axe. He said, you are my battle axe and weapons of war. And after that, 10 times God says, with you, I'm going to change this system around. I believe right now, May of 2015, there's more battle axes out here on this field struggling every day to turn this thing around than the world knows. But in the end, God is going to, through those battle axes and those weapons, will turn this thing around and establish righteousness for a, a group of people who have been treated and mistreated unfairly for centuries now.
Well, Pastor Thomas Dixon and Elder James Johnson. We shall overcome. Okay. Yes, we will. All right. This yes, is a great will. interview. Thank you so much for yes. your time. All righty. I appreciate I'll, it. I would ask the world, do you believe us now? <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate right. it. Thank you, brother. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank, Thank you. you.